refocus and take that information that you kind of called upon about the behaviors that you were trying to change. What helped? What hindered those behaviors? And were you actually able to maintain them? Because really asking somebody to change a specific behavior is, is difficult to do. And as an educator, you really need to try to figure out how you can help them get over those hurdles or barriers and put in place the things that will help make that behavior change more successful. Okay. So first, when we um, started this project, we wanted to figure out which were the specific behaviors that we wanted to target. And we used then those to uh, develop an uh, assessment tool and the intervention components. So my colleagues at UC Davis conducted a literature review to focus on um, determinants or factors that influenced pediatric obesity um, in low-income communities and those kinds of determinants that were modifiable by the family. What was found supported in the literature were 12 determinants and they were um, kind of fit into three different categories so diet related determinants uh, like fruit and vegetable intake like dietary fat intake lifestyle like television or screen time um, and even parenting styles and so those were the determinants that we were going to use to kind of focus um, our intervention and assessment tools but then we actually needed to find out what were the behaviors um, to actually integrate into the intervention. So um, 23 behaviors were identified, supported by the literature. Um, so for example, parent modeling was very important in this audience. Um, so modeling uh, fruit and vegetable intake, uh, being physically active with their children, those sorts of things. So we had a long list of behaviors that we wanted to try to target um, and focus on. Those then were translated into risk assessment tool that had two parts. One is what we called healthy kids, and it focused on the eating, physical activity, sleep, um, and screen time behaviors. And then um, on the flip side, there was a parenting styles or feeding practices component that was used to tailor the intervention for the participants, and I'll talk more about that later. So to kind of give a concrete example of how we took these behaviors and integrated them into the assessment, as well as the intervention, I wanted just to pull a couple so you could kind of see what I'm talking about. So for example, modeling the behavior, the parent modeling the behavior for their preschool age children was found to be very important in um, obesity prevention. So in the assessment tool, there are several questions, and here are just a few. For example, um, I sit with uh, my child um, while eating or I play outside with my child, um, so many days a week was an assessment tool question, or that my child actually sees me eat vegetables, which of course would usually mean that they need to sit together at the table and have a meal together. And in the intervention, then we translated those behaviors into specific goals that the parents could select from. So for example, parents could select from a goal, uh, play outside with my child um, so many days per week, or actually sit and have a meal with my child so many days a week. So those were some goals that they could actually choose from and work on. So we've identified the determinants and the behaviors to focus on and then we're translating them directly into the intervention via goal setting activities and then also lesson plan activities. So each lesson the parents were able to kind of get up and practice and try things and some of them were kind of um, fun and silly but the parents all seemed to enjoy them so things like balloon toss and musical chairs kind of active games that they can play with their children um, we incorporated those into the lessons as well um, and another example um, planning meals was found to be related to um, pediatric obesity in our target audience. So one of the questions in the assessment tool is, I plan meals. And um, a goal that parents could select from uh, had to do with um, using your favorite you know, recipe and um, planning the meal for that week. And we also uh, developed an activity where parents could use um, the My Kind of Plate guidelines to prepare a meal where they use the um, grocery store ads. So they're kind of planning ahead using what's on sale and in season and using some of the kind of My Plate guidelines as well. So they're practicing these um, things that we'd like them to do. Okay. 
So um, after we focused on which behaviors to target, then we needed kind of the roadmap of how to develop the intervention. And we selected social cognitive theory to guide that as well as goal setting. Um, and as you probably already know, um, behavioral theories really can provide that roadmap of how to develop the intervention and also to kind of explain how behavior change happens. And that interventions that often are based on behavioral theories are more effective at changing behavior than those that are not. So the social cognitive theory as you most likely know, um, really emphasizes that behavior change is influenced by personal factors of the individual, like the skill set that they have to perform a particular behavior, their confidence to actually do that behavior, what they expect um, from changing their behavior, and even the environment. Um, you know, the influence of their peers, as well as um, the physical environment, what's available to them. Are there good walking paths so they can take their kids on a bike ride, or that um, the park is suitable to take their kids outside and play. So those things all interplay in um, the behavior change process, and we try to address those in our intervention. So um, the ones that I have underlined are the ones I'm going to give you some specific examples of how we did this because I thought that would be uh, most useful for you is how can you take this rather robust theory, fairly complicated, and translate it into some specific activities in an intervention. So I'm going to focus on um, giving you examples of how we try to improve parents' self-efficacy to perform particular behaviors and how we promoted self-regulation by self-monitoring, um, goal setting I'll talk about in a little bit, and some barriers, counseling, etc. So for example, we tried in every single interaction that we had with the parents, which was five one hour and 15 minute sessions. So we didn't have a lot of time with these parents, um, but that was about what we could expect out of fairly busy uh, parents of young children. And um, you know, of course, you know, we would love months and months of intervention and, and dozens of classes, but this is all we had. So in each of those uh, lessons, we tried to have them practice what we wanted them to do. So for example, I talked about the games, the active games they could do with their kids. They, we didn't just tell them about them, we had them do them. And that made class a little bit more fun too. Um, there was always recipe preparation and tasting in the lessons as well, so that parents could take what we're asking them to do, have a recipe to try, they practice it, and they're more likely then to do it at home, or be more confident to do it. Also, we had them practice label reading with regards to the specific foods and behaviors we were looking at them to change. Um, and also a meal planning activity, like I talked about before, where they actually can take what's in season and what's on ad and plan those meals ahead of time. Because parents that are more likely to plan meals will have family meals at home as opposed to eating out, which is related to pediatric um, obesity. Self-monitoring, we used the assessment tools that were developed specifically for this target audience and had them actually complete these assessment tools at the beginning of the intervention. So that then the content could be um, used to tailor some of the parts of the lesson plans to them. So by giving them examples of something that they were doing fairly well in and something, um, a few things that they could improve upon. After parents worked on actually setting specific goals and trying to reach them, we incorporated an activity where they talked about what actually got in the way of them achieving those goals. And we used group activities so that the parents could actually talk to each other and share how they addressed some of these kind of concerns. So we gave them examples of common barriers on little cards like this, um, and then solutions and then they were to come up with their own barriers to their goals and then as a group um, come up with solutions too. And also, when changing behavior, it's a good idea to try to come up with a way to reward yourself for reaching your goals. And we included an activity where parents actually thought about what they would do to reward themselves if they actually met their weekly goal. 
Um, and it was a fun activity because parents came up with all kinds of creative things. And it didn't have to be anything that cost money. Um, and most of the time when I would read the parents um, kind of things they would want to reward themselves with, it was quiet time. <laughs> So they do have young children, so you know they just wanted 15 or 20 minutes um, to read a magazine or to take a bubble bath or you know just to kind of take a walk and get away or maybe um, rent a DVD with their friends or something like that. So it was fun for them to kind of think of things that they could implement to reward themselves for changing a behavior, which we talk about is is difficult. Um, and then we also spent quite a bit of time each lesson on goal setting. And I'm sure everybody um, in your lifetime has set several goals, right? Um, it may be to improve your grade point average or to lose weight or be more physically active. Um, but goal setting actually can focus your attention and motivate you and we wanted to integrate that process through our intervention. Um, what goal setting theory states is that goals that are specific as opposed to general are more effective. So instead of saying, um, I want to lose weight, um, a more specific goal would be to uh, maybe lose a pound this week. Right? And that would also then incorporate the idea of proximity. So picking a goal that had um, a end point that wasn't this year, you know, lose 20 pounds this year, but do something this week. And we all know that when we set goals, um, or maybe even something is due a few months from now, we can put it off. And so if there's something, um, a shorter time frame, um, we're a little bit more motivated to, to get it done. Um, goals do need to be challenging. I mean, have you ever had a goal that's, oh, this is so easy, this assignment's so easy, so you can put it off, put it off, put it off and then maybe not get to it. And so it does need to be something that's challenging, but not too far-fetched that then you just feel discouraged and not try it. So um, that's important in helping people to formulate goals so that they are more effective and more likely to be achieved. Also, tracking the goal progress has a motivational component too. So um, the goal setting framework that uh, we used starts with self-assessment, so using these um, assessment tools that I've talked about before that then um, can help parents decide what they want to focus on. Setting goals that are specific, uh, that are proximal, difficult yet attainable. Um, and then try to help the parents establish commitment towards the goal. Because we can set goals, have them all over here, but not really try for them. Um, and then establish some mechanism for feedback and rewarding, which I've talked about. Um, and once people start to achieve the goals, they actually feel more confident to select a goal that is maybe a little bit more complex or difficult the next round. In setting goals, traditionally, um, you can ask somebody, you know, you just say at the end of the lesson, why don't you guys go ahead and set a, set a goal on the content that we've covered today. That would be a self-set goal. Um, if you have the opportunity and maybe of a small group, you could work one-on-one -on -one with the client and actually set a goal with them. So you would find out what they're interested in, but tailor it to what we know about effective goal setting. Right? Um, and then there could be um, where you know, there really isn't the time or the opportunity and you would just say, okay, um, so everybody this week try to work on increasing dietary fiber. So I'm going to assign those goals. Uh, when working with um, our other low-income populations, particularly adolescents, we found that those methods didn't seem appropriate and we developed a different type of goal setting that kind of combines all of those types um, and we call it guided goal setting. And we took that concept and applied it to this audience too, so parents of young children. And what we did is took the assessment tools um, and generated then personalized results. So up top, if you see a little star on your nutrition quiz results, um, we would make sure that parents got kind of rewarded for at least doing well or better than the other areas then, so that we weren't just saying you're doing so bad in all of these areas. And then to give parents idea, oh, no. <laughs> How about the red one? Um, what they could work on, and this would be kind of the overarching or major goal, um, and then underneath are those specific things like play outside with your child three days a week. And that then they can choose something um, that has the proximity, specificity, so forth in those goals related to their self-assessment so they feel like it's tailored to them. 
um, and that they can then try that. So we're kind of guiding them through the process, particularly because the interventions groups um, that we work with are maybe groups of between six and 15, and so working one-on-one -on -one really isn't possible. This is kind of guiding them through that process. Uh, there's also an ability for the parents to put their goal they've selected into a contract and have somebody in their family sign that, as well as tracking their progress weekly as well. Okay, are there any questions? So now I want to take you through some of the ways that we try to tailor our education materials for our low income, ethnically diverse parents of young children. So for example, in the assessment tools, if you can tell, um, it doesn't just look like a standard survey, um, but it's there's lots of white space or as opposed to this green space. Um, the sentences or questions are very short. Um, and there's pictures as well. And that, those were all done for specific reasons. Now the pictures actually were taken from parents um, participating in programs like Head Start and WIC and so forth. So we actually went out and took pictures so that parents would feel connected um, even when just doing the assessment tool, which was what we did in our first lesson so that they could um, you know, relate to what we're trying to ask them. As opposed to some of those pictures or CDs that you can buy um, that may show kitchens and playgrounds that don't look anything like what they have access to. A lot of time was taken to also make sure that these questions were appropriate for parents that had literacy issues, which is more common in low income populations. So increasing the font size of the text, reducing the sentence link, um, length, making sure that there weren't multi-syllable words, um, and that also the parents were um, interviewed and asked, you know, how could we make this um, question better? What does this question mean to you to make sure that um, we're using our words um, in a very precise way and that we can use fewer of them. And the pictures alongside also kind of help with the meaning of the um, questions too. Now we took the guided goal setting concept and then talked to parents too. So we wanted to know what would they like to have the goals about and what motivates them. And they told us that they liked goals that involved their children. Uh, that they liked goals that involved shopping and meal planning and so we did that. We uh, made sure that the goals reflected things that they were interested in doing. And of course, related to uh, the behaviors uh, that we're targeting. We developed materials like handouts and workbooks that of course use those pictures that looked uh, like the audience um, and made sure that the reading level was appropriate. The goal setting activities were also informed by parents they wanted us to make it so that it was flexible, meaning they could choose from the pre-formatted goals that we gave them, uh, or that they could write their own. And we also um, allowed some more flexibility that they could work on the same goal through the five-week intervention, or they could pick a new one every week if they felt like they wanted to. So there was more flexibility, and those concepts were driven by interviews with the families. Okay. So another way that we tried to incorporate um, hands-on activities and models to help them with portion size, with fruit and vegetable intake and et cetera, was to use a kind of plate concept. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with uh, USDA My Plate. Hold it once, and then go ahead and open it up, and there should be a crease halfway through the plate. And then go ahead and make kind of a dotted or straight line across. And on that portion, you're going to write fruits and vegetables. And then fold the paper plate in half the other direction. Okay. 
and it and it is important to try to get the more flexible, cheaper paper plates. It makes the activity a lot easier. When you get the nice sturdy chinette, it doesn't work well. So save your dollars and buy the, the really cheap ones because they fold much better. So fold it in half and then of course then do a dotted line up to the center of that line all the way across and just in one section. And then in either corner, of course, one is for grains and one for protein. We even had parents when I was doing interviews where, I don't know why this happened, but there weren't enough paper plates for the class, so people had to share. And that each week then this pair of participants would share the paper plate. So one week one parent would have it and put it on their refrigerator and then the next week the other parent would have it and put it on the refrigerator. And that was a reminder to, you know, work on their goals and things like that. It was I thought it was pretty cute, but it would be nice if everybody had their own paper plate. So this was a hands-on activity that we did to introduce the concept of uh, more fruits and vegetables, you know, plate size, proportions, and so forth. And that parents again reported that it was so easy that they did it with their three, four, and five-year-old children as well as kind of a home activity. And that they put it on the refrigerator to help kind of remind them um, of what they should be doing. But what our extension advisors found is that this kind of abstract graphic wasn't uh, working as well as they thought that it should. And they interviewed parents to see what was going on. Um, and what they said is that they needed actual photos of what the foods they eat would look like on a plate in these desired proportions. Okay. So what was done is that foods that were commonly e eaten by participants in the expanded food and nutrition education program were reviewed and commonly eaten foods were then put into proportions um, and photographed. And of course some of the healthier options were integrated in there, maybe whole wheat bread um, or um, you know fruits and more fruits and vegetables and things like that. And um, parents then were asked to say would they eat these foods and does this look appealing because we wanted to have photos that would look appealing to parents too that wouldn't turn them off from this concept so uh, photos then based on that were taken and then translated into different education materials like posters handouts um, meal cards recipe cards and so forth even the messages on the actual handouts uh, were in, um, tested with clients um, and we found that they did prefer things like make milk part of your meal, um, fill half of your plate, you know we gave different options of serve and fill um, and they had certain preferences even with the wording and the graphics too so we had a graphic designer help us uh, with the dots around and you know we had lots of options of dots and circles and different things and they helped us to design materials that would be appealing to uh, the audience. We also made sure we had things that participants could take home so besides the paper plate they had a handout, they had goal sheets and things that they could do as well as an activity that they could do with their preschool aged children. So uh, parents told us that when they um, try to make the kids lunch or dinner plates look like my plate and um, that the kids thought it looked weird or strange um, and so doing an activity where the kids could participate color in what they would like to see and then the parents actually prepare that meal helped with some of those transitions too okay so after um, we developed the materials and implemented them in interventions, we tested them mostly for their feasibility and we're also conducting um, an effectiveness trial as we speak. So what did we find out with the guided goal setting? Parents seem to like the methodology um, and that they liked that personal feedback, that it gave them ideas of what to work on and that they didn't even know that some of the things they should be working on. So one of the quotes was that it gave them a wake up call you know, something that they never really thought of to actually work on. Parents participated in setting goals and working towards them and that they liked that um, there were goal options. So it didn't seem to um, infringe on participants actually 
you know, feeling like they could make their own decisions. They liked to have the ideas. But what we found is the intervention weeks would go on, they felt more confident at actually setting their own goals. So for the first few weeks, they would select hours um, that we had kind of made for them, and then they would create their own towards the end. But that they didn't really like the goal contract. Um, and one of the reasons is we had their classmates sign the contract, and they said that wasn't motivating, that they actually needed their significant other or somebody else that helped take care of their children sign that contract. So we kind of changed the activity so that it involved um, taking it home as well. Uh, we also found out that parents, they liked the pictures that we used for kind of helping with the idea of My Healthy Plate, and they got the main concept. For example, less meat, more fruits and vegetables. Um, and kind of a side thing that I really didn't anticipate was that not only using the pictures to figure out the proportions of the plate is something that was um, important for them, but they also got ideas on what to serve their kids from the picture. So I had several parents tell me, I always just served pizza. Pizza was dinner pizza and something to drink. And now looking at the pictures now, I serve a salad or carrots or something else with it. Um, and the same was for our spaghetti photos where we had fruit and a salad served with spaghetti. And often the parents would say, well, I just serve spaghetti and French bread. So the pictures served kind of as two, two reasons, to help parents with the proportions, but also ideas for menu planning too. Um, what we found is the most challenging aspect, and we're still working on how to to um, figure this one out, is that parents weren't able to use these My Healthy Plate concepts when eating out. They said they just couldn't do it. One reason was this, that they said, I don't go out very often, and when I go out, it's kind of a celebration, and so I don't want to think about you know, making half my plate fruits and vegetables. And also, they just couldn't visualize what the meal at the restaurant could look like and making it half fruit and vegetables and so forth. So I think we need to work on some more photo options of what fast food and restaurant type meals would look like in those proportions. And that they did not like the idea of putting cold fruit on a plate with savory and warm dishes. Okay, I get it, right? You don't want your watermelon touching your baked beans. Um, but, you know, to make the the plate in the right proportion, we had to do something like that. So we realized putting the fruit in bowls and on the plate was a way to do that. And that they were interested in things like text message reminders. So, you know, these parents are very tech savvy and they wouldn't mind having reminders about working on their goal or, you know, hey, try to plan a meal tonight using my healthy plate as kind of a motivation. Okay, so hopefully after my presentation you would be able to describe a few behaviors that could be targeted to reduce pediatric obesity risk. Right, hopefully come up with a few. Um, that you can take some of the theoretical constructs and apply them in um, a real world setting. And lastly, hopefully um, you could take some existing education materials and try to tailor them to your audience, whether it's their food preferences, literacy level, or just making um, the photos uh, relevant to the clients as well.